Okay, thank you everybody. Um, welcome. Here we are uh, again. This time we're discussing differentiating for learning as part of the differentiating for learning online course. So thank you very much to the National STEM Learning Centre for commissioning um, Chris and Dylan to be part of this research and learning programme. A huge thank you to Chris and Dylan for giving up their time to come and talk to us about the various questions that you've asked. Chris, I have to tell you, is not very well. So thank you, Chris endeavouring with a very poorly throat and thank you as well to Paul Browning in the background who is our technical support. Most of all thank you to everybody who has participated so far or you know it's been really interesting to look at your learning as we've gone through but also for the questions that you've given us for this evening. So without further ado we shall begin. So our uh, next question I think these two questions I'm going to put them together so this is from Canthia and from Pampa and they're both asking about mastery and metacognition. Um, Dylan, I'm going to ask you, so they're both asking, can you suggest any techniques, tips, uh, in terms of helping learners empower themselves, particularly with regards to mastery and metacognition? Well, first of all, I mean, I'm not sure what people mean by mastery. The term is being bandied about quite a lot today, and much of it bears little relationship to the way that Benjamin Bloom used it back in the 1970s. So, um, uh, but metacognition uh, is, well, the person who invented the, the word, John Flavel, described it as thinking about thinking. So mm -hmm. if you say, I'm having more trouble learning this than that, then you're functioning metacognitively. If you realize you're stuck and actually you're not making any progress, then you're thinking metacognitively. So it's anything that students can do to actually manage their own, to, to, to be kind of um, the architect of their own learning. Is, is metacognition, and there's no doubt that the best learners, the most effective students, do function metacognitively, and that metacognition can be taught. But there's much less useful guidance about exactly the best way to do that. But um, you know, so the, kind of the questions I asked earlier, you know, can you make up three more questions like this, one harder than this, one easier than this, one about the same level? Any time we get students to think about you know, which, which of these tasks was the easiest, which of these was the most interesting, which of these did you find the most challenging? Any kind of process like that um, can actually begin students on that, on that kind of journey. And the, the important point is it, it, it's always a good idea to get learners to think about learning. That's the really important point. There's lots of useful work in Guy Claxton's work on building learning power. I mean, Neil Mercer's work as well is useful here. But it's about giving students a, a language to talk about their learning, to help them with that process. And then it's just finding opportunities to reinforce that in every single lesson, just as going on about thinking about thinking. It's almost like giving students a, a user's manual for the brain. And anything we can do along those lines will actually help. Brilliant. Thank you very much. It's, it's interesting that you say that the, the research about it and the strategies, the strategies out there are not that well known. Because I know that the Sutton Trust, is it the Education Endowment Foundation? They've got metacognition and self-regulation up there now as a number one approach or intervention in terms of gains on student learning, which echoes what you say. I don't know what the what, what ideas and strategies they give, but that might be somewhere else for people to go and have a look for further ideas. Yep. Okay, thank you, Dylan. Chris, anything to add on that one? No, that's fine. Right, I'm moving on to you now, Chris. So thank you very much, um, Canthia and Pampa, for your questions. We're now moving on to a question. Uh, this next little set are about um, in-class practice, how we can actually do things. I mean, to be honest, we've had so many ideas about in-class practice already. Um, I know that I'm going to listen and go through the transcript later and write down a list of myself, top tips and ideas. But uh, these ones are looking particularly at questions asked about that. So Kelly, um, Chris, is asking a question related to the fact that she has got a lot of EAL pupils. She said she's got over 27 languages in the school. Any top tips or ideas on addressing this in terms of differentiation? How can we make that work in, in situations like that? Um, I think for some kids, if it's EAL uh, and you're going to be setting them challenging activities, you need to allow them to speak in the language, as long as there are at least two children who speak that language, the language that they understand best in, which is probably their first language. Um, and then to spend some time translating it into a language that's more common for others to actually key in and join in with. Certainly there's been some research 
done on that that shows um, get children to fulfil their potential more if you allow that to happen. Uh, I think generally in terms of EAL, is looking at the resources that you provide. Often um, people provide things for EAL where they just try to get them to use uh, dictionaries uh, or some sort of checklist of words, etc. But sometimes it's not the words that are part of the topic that's important. So it's not the words, if you go back to photosynthesis, it's the photosynthesis. But the questions you're asking them deal with um, and the things that you're actually asking them to do within the task that can cause the problem. So it's making those simple so their mind's not tasked with what I'm being asked, what's expected of me, um, what do I need to do in order to fulfill that. That is actually quite clear and easy to do. So that then the differentiation comes from the task itself and not from trying to interpret what the task is that's actually written on the sheet. So I would say fewer sheets, fewer things written down, more discussion, allowing kids to talk within their own language as well as within the language of the classroom that everybody's using. Uh, and then you know, allowing them to do things that, that they know will help them. So many kids will have their phone out, will be using a dictionary of some sort or some sort of support. Just allow that so that they can actually um, buy in to whatever the activity is and they're not being held back just simply because of the language problems that they're having. Brilliant. Okay, um, moving on now, we've got a question here from Anthea. Dylan, I'm going to give this one to you. Uh, Anthea is a secondary teacher, and she says, do you think it's necessary, in your opinion, to use some kind of formative assessment in every lesson? Uh, yes, and I guarantee that Anthea is doing it already. Because the only way you can avoid doing formative assessment as a teacher is to speak your lessons into a video camera and relay it to students in a different classroom. The only way you cannot be doing formative assessment is if you can't see the students that you're talking to. If they can't hear them, you can't communicate with them in any way. As soon as a teacher is looking at the reactions on students' faces and making judgments about what that means about, am I going too fast, am I going too slow, then you're doing formative assessment. The problem is, of course, most of the evidence we're collecting is just not very good evidence. So if I rely on students' facial expressions, then I might be being misled by the students who know that it's a good idea to nod and smile because then the teacher won't pick on you because they think you're understanding or they'll only pick on the students who are frowning because they look puzzled. Uh, you know, if you're asking a class a question, if you only get responses from the confident students, you can't possibly make learning decisions that are right for every single kid in the class. So. Every teacher, face to face with her students, is doing formative assessment. The only question is, what's the quality of the evidence involved? And is it adequate? It's never going to be perfect. The question is, do I have enough good evidence for the decision at hand? And as long as that is the driving force, then I think formative assessment becomes manageable. It's just coming back to this idea, decision-driven data collection. Just collect the minimum amount of information that will help you make the decisions you need to make in a smarter way that genuinely reflects the needs of your students. Brilliant. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, Chris, anything to add to that one? Or are you quite happy? No, I agree. Yeah. All assessment. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Time. Thank you. I was going to say yeah. Oh, Chris, I lost that last bit. So I don't know if you just want to repeat it. Sorry, when I know your voice is strange, but if you could just repeat it for us. Any way you'd get away without doing is if you had your eyes closed as you were teaching. You wouldn't see what the kids were responding to. Just keep your eyes open. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you, Mel, very much. Uh, right, I'm going to our next question now, which is from Shireen Ramadan. Uh, Shireen asks, um, Chris, i put this down for you to answer first. How should I handle a class with more than one attention seeker? Um, he's always taking so much time in finishing activities and this makes other kids feel frustrated. What should they do regarding this? Um, I think just, um, I mean, I'm not a behaviour management expert, but um, how I've seen teachers deal with students like this uh, is by actually deflating the attention. So 
um, you know, if he's not finishing his work, he's not finishing his work. Give him less to do or, you know, don't make a fuss when he's not doing it. If it is a he, or it is a he, I can see in the question. Mm -hmm. um, just moving them on so that he actually gets taken along with the flow of the class. Um, if you spend a lot of time focusing on one kid and there's confrontation and the other kids aren't getting on, then that's not fair to the rest of the class. So it's finding ways that he can be involved uh, and accepting what you think is reasonable to accept from him in terms of effort and in terms of what he's actually capable of. Um, and it could be that he does need some support. Maybe he does need help. You know, either somebody reading whatever it is that needs to be read to him or providing him with a, um, an audio tape of that particular bit or some alternative way of doing that reading, maybe a simplified version of it. If that's the case, he can't access in, the teacher should be doing something about that. If it's just a kid who's wasting everyone's time, don't let him be an attention seeker. Put your attention to the rest of the class. Praise what they're doing well, rather than spend a lot of time trying to sort him out for what he's not doing well. It needs to change the tenor in the class. Uh, and the other kids uh, realise that you know he's a difficult kid. He'll put up with one or two bits. But as long as they get on with their learning, they feel happy about their learning and it seems to settle down much better. Lovely. Thank you, Chris. I'm also going to flag up Shireen. Uh, oh, sorry, Dylan, you go. Sorry. The more I thought about this question as, as Chris was responding, I, I began to realise I'm not sure I understand the question. Because mm -hmm. it seems to me that an attention seeker is not the same as a student who takes longer to finish the work. Mm -hmm. So, um, after, going back to the points I was making earlier, Attention seeking is often just a reaction to work that's too that's perceived as too hard. So it may be necessary to make the work easier. That student is is, is thinking I'm going to fail here, so I might as well do something that basically distracts the, the class. Um, if it's if it's like, moving too slowly, then I think as Chris said, you need to think about reducing the amount of work that you're giving that person so they're all finishing um, at roughly the same time, or just have some more differentiation for the other students. Mm -hmm. um, but absolutely, I think you know one of the things we must never do is allow one or two students to disrupt the education of the majority. I think that's where we went wrong in the 1960s. There's still too much of that. Um, basically, students should not be allowed to disrupt the education of others, and we need to take drastic measures to deal with that kind of low-level disruption. Yeah, thank you, Dylan. It also made me think while you were both talking about does everybody, and it'd be interesting what you think, does everybody have to wait for everybody to be at the same point to move on? You know, if others are getting frustrated, yeah. move them on, you know. And I think that's some of the ideas we've talked about in the in the differentiating course. The other thing I wanted to flag up, Shireen, is that as part of the National STEMS Learning Centre's suite of online courses that they run through FutureLearn, there's also a Behaviour for Learning course. And you might find that a really useful one to go and have a look at. Because, again, it's set within the context of STEM subjects, so that might help you with some strategies if it is behaviour that's the issue. But as Dylan and Chris said, it might be looking deeper, there might be other things that are there that are causing the problem. So thank you very much, Shireen. Uh, moving on, on, uh, moving on now to Shelley Whitehorn. I'm doing Willy Wonka and getting all the <laughs> wrong way around. Uh, moving on to Shelley Whitehorn's question. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, I'm going to ask Dylan first. And I think, Shelley, it's interesting your question, because I think you... From what we've heard already, and from what you've, you've asked here, I think you're already starting to answer your own question. Um, Shelley's asking that when she's got a great lesson underway and children are participating and engaged and, and want to ask questions or just share what they've achieved, achieved, she often feels pulled in every direction. It can be exhausting. Is there an easier way? And she also asks, are simple strategies like group work and peer tutoring appropriate for this situation? So Dylan, what are your thoughts? Um, I'm smiling because Shelley's calling group work simple. And the one thing that we know is that organizing effective group work is not simple. So teachers routinely get kids to work in groups, and it's often highly ineffective because they don't put in place the two cardinal requirements of effective group work, which is group goals and individual accountability. Mm -hmm. So kids have to be working as a group, not just in a group. And every individual in the group has to be responsible and accountable for the quality of contributions to the group task. So you have to set up group work in a way that one student falling down on the job messes it up for everybody. And most teachers don't do that. 
Most teachers set up group work in a way that allows one or two students to do the work of the whole group. And then it's actually less effective than a teacher standing in front of the class and talking at the kids. So um, group work is incredibly hard. Um, peer tutoring is also incredibly hard. We've seen systems where teachers have set up ideas, ways of kids recording their own self-assessment. I understand this. And then other kids go to those kids for help. And students give their peers completely misleading advice. So peer tutoring, if you're going to set up peer tutoring, you really, as a teacher, have to be eavesdropping on the quality of the conversations those students are having. Mm -hmm. Because it's the teacher's choice about peer tutoring. If you choose to use peer tutoring, the teacher is still responsible for the quality of learning that takes place. And you need to be looking at the kind of support that students are getting. Some teachers um, do look at a traffic light system. Green means got it, yellow means not so sure, red means no idea what's going on. But they use a fourth color, blue. And blue means I, as the teacher, have checked your understanding of this topic. And I'm now certifying you as a teacher of this topic to go and help others. So there's lots of ways around this. But it turns out that these two things are very powerful, but anything um, but simple. Um, the second point about being pulled in multiple directions, I think it just comes with time. One of the interesting things about teacher expertise, and this is the work of Jim Hebert uh, at the University of Delaware in the United States, what he's shown is that expert teachers are very good at deciding whether an idea that a kid comes up with is a good way of moving forward the learning of the whole class. So novice teachers they either get completely sidetracked by a student's question and go down the rabbit hole, or they stick to the script relentlessly and they completely ignore any kind of departure from that that the students might want to raise. But I think the, 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 the thing that comes from expertise and practice is just the way of using contributions from students as either saying, no, we're going to put that on one side because it's not relevant, or yes, here's how we're going to use this to move the whole class's thinking on this topic forward. As I said, it, it just seems to be very hard to speed that process up. You just have to teach a lot and, and have that clear goal of where you're going for the students. With the students. It's that, that clarity of where I want to get my students to. Sometimes that changes. You might change where you're going in the middle of a lesson. You realize it's actually quite a productive way to take the lesson. But the, the good teachers are always thinking about where I am now, where am I heading to, how can I use what's happening right now to move the class forward in that direction. Brilliant. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you for your question. I'm sure lots of people, Shelley, will appreciate that and, and find the advice given there really beneficial. So, Chris, I'm going to move on to Charmaine uh, Zhang's question here. Um, the first part of Charmaine's question, I think we've already answered, so I'm going to just ask the second part, which is, do you consider mixing students with different abilities in the same class, or is it better to stream? Um... I would always go for different abilities, but even within streaming, you're going to have different abilities. It's just maybe a slightly narrow range. And if you had uh, the whole range of the cohort, your year group there. So um, what, you, what you want are children who can talk with one another, um, share their ideas and feel confident about doing it. At the same time, maybe their ideas are uh, at different levels in terms of sophistication or in terms of um, the approach that they're taking or in terms of the detail that they're giving. Because it's then that they will start to ask one another, what do you mean by that? Does that mean this? Um, I think that means the same as this. Do you think that? So what you need is something that will actually promote dialogue and discussion in the classrooms. So that will be the activity or the question that the teachers actually decided students are going to work on uh, and then you know it is setting up um, really uh, a mixing to some extent so that they're not all just agreeing or, or disagreeing with something they've got something that they feel uh, is variable in terms of the result, sort of response that they might get from kids how I've seen teachers do this well uh, with questioning to come up with a good question so it might be, um, is friction similar or different on the moon to what it is on Earth? Uh, which is quite a complex question to think about in terms of science. But in thinking about that question, whether it's going to work or not with your 15, 16 year old physicist, he's thinking about, so what might the highest attaining student say to that? What sort of answer might you get to that from them? 
What's the lowest attain on your class likely to say? The one who has difficulty accessing in. What's that unusual child in your class who always has these wild ideas? What are they likely to say? If those three answers are different, that's a good question in terms of starting off differentiation. It gives you that sort of key into it being there's something to talk about here. It's going to be a variety of opinions and thoughts. We can build on that in the lesson. If the answer from all three of those students will be the same, you're not going to get much differentiation there. You're either going to get some kids doing it and some not, or you're going to have to just try and move them all towards what the right answer is. And that's not what we're after. We're after not just correct answers, but we're after the reasoning as to why they are correct uh, and how you build on that and how you connect that with other things. Uh, and that comes from having uh, mixed abilities in your classrooms, whether you're talking about or mixed ability or banding or streaming. I mean, I, I personally prefer mixed ability teaching. And as a teacher, I always taught in mixed, taught mixed ability groups. So did I, um, sorry. The arguments, the, the arguments against ability grouping are actually incredibly strong. First of all, given the reliability of assessments, there's no way of getting more than 50% of students into the right group. Yeah. Basically, you can't possibly assess kids accurately enough so that they're actually differentiated appropriately in different groups. Um, uh, and, you know, there's no doubt that this is compounded by the fact that we often give the best teachers to the top groups, when in fact the best teachers are more useful for the bottom groups. Mm. So ability grouping seems nationally to lower achievement because it produces benefits for the highest achievers, the expensive losses for the lowest achievers, and the gains for the highest achievers are smaller than the losses for the lowest achievers. So the net effect is to spread out the students more and to slightly lower the average. Mm. But... I think I would acknowledge that there are certain classrooms, there are certain schools where the teachers are so um, borderline effective that they might actually be better teaching in sets than in mixed ability. So I don't think you can separate out the decision about whether it's best to group these students by ability or not from the issue of the organizational and subject knowledge skills of the individual teachers. So I think it's an incredibly complex uh, uh, debate. And I, and I wouldn't straight out of, the, um, uh, out of the beginning condemn a department for grouping by ability. The other thing to remember, of course, is this is also not something where evidence has any role to play because the primary reason that schools group kids by ability is because middle class parents like it because they assume their kids are going to be in the top sets. So it's a way of producing grammar schools within the comprehensive system by actually creating top sets, which middle class parents like. So it, it's one of those issues that um, it, it, the evidence doesn't actually help you, help you very much because people aren't making the decisions on the basis of evidence. They're making them on either on prejudice or on just trying to secure more benefits for their children in terms of access to the best teachers. Lovely. Thank you very much. It also made me think of points that we had earlier on that you both mentioned about increasing the variability as well. You know, getting different responses and different ideas and thinking about that and chucking that into the mix. Uh, thank you very much, Charmaine. Um, interesting conversation. That one made me smile, that one. Right, moving on to Lizzie Bell now. Um, Lizzie Bell Dillon, she's got some students who are really needy again. Um, but this time I think it's a slightly different question. Um, that she's got certain students that don't dare to start until they've, until she's actually had a chance to get to them and tell them that they're getting on the, lo the right lines at which point behaviour can disintegrate. Have you got any tried and tested ideas that can help her in this particular situation with her classes? I think the first thing to say is there are no simple solutions here. Mm -hmm. um, you need a very careful analysis of what's going wrong here. And if it's those kids, uh, you can have some kids who are really high achieving, but very needy. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's, I think it's appropriate to assume that it's a, a, an ability uh, issue here. It could be that they're just insecure and they need assurance every step of the way. So the, the, you know, it might be that you have um, tasks with a much more gentle introduction. So I, I personally wouldn't object to doing some busy work with these students just to get them started. So, for example, you know, one of the things I used to do as a math teacher is give kids tables um, to, to fill in and you know, you have a function or a graph and you have to fill in some values. And the kid would say, I can't do it. And I would say, OK, well, just copy out that table and I'll come back in two minutes to help you fill it in. 
And often just the busy work of copying out a table had calmed the child down enough. So they began to notice the patterns and they were able to do it themselves. But sometimes you just need to get the students experiencing some success. Sometimes it's just reducing the panic and just calming things down. So there's lots of things you can do, but, but I think the important thing is, to, is just to get to the point where students feel that if you are giving them something to do, this is likely to be something they can do. Maybe get kids to work in pairs. Um, that, that can be a way of, of, of reducing the number of immediate demands for help and disruption. But there's no simple solution here. But I think the idea of getting students used to the idea that if I'm giving you this task, I can probably do it. Um, and then the other thing is, coming back to Carol Dweck's work on mindset, there's a very useful phrase that um, they use, they mention in a paper where the first, first author is Lisa Blackwell. Everything is hard before it's easy. And just reminding students about that. Yeah, everything is hard before it's easy. And just saying, this is hard, but you'll be able to do it, and then you'll be able to move on. So uh, there's, there's no simple answer, just lots of small things you can try. Lovely. Thank you very much, Dylan. Chris, anything to add? No. Okay, great. Thank okay, you. Right, moving on. Sorry. Sorry, Chris. Sorry. Uh, moving on to our next uh, category. These are some, um, so they were in class approaches and practice. And again, we've had loads of ideas. So this little section is examples of approaches. Um, our first question is from Julia Tsaigan. Julie is asking, is there, and I think it's interesting, is there a flow chart? or something that can allow somebody to choose different assessment and or differentiation techniques based on the subject, topic, skills, and students' characteristics? Chris? I think the answer to that is no. Um, there are bits around that might help some people. Um, so in science, um, for some topics, people have uh, anticipated what um, Progression is through that topic, so you can actually have a look at that. I mean, Erin Furtak in the States done it for um, natural selection and evolution. Uh, but it's her ideas of how she thinks students progress through that topic. Um, and then she's got some assessments that go along with that. That's not to say that that is actually how every child will um, build up their understanding of natural selection and evolution. It's Erin's idea, which has got an assessment for that, which you can, that teachers can then use to see whether some of their children are doing it like that. So we've got a long way to go um, in terms of mapping progression, the way that students go through learning. And it will be variable from student to student. Not every student will be different routes through. Um, I think the main thing is not to worry so much about that, but to maybe think of a topic that's coming up you're going to teach and think what are the basic key bits they need before they get onto the more difficult bits. So I've been working today with my pre-service teachers on genetics. We were looking at what have they really got to understand and get sorted out before we get onto difficult things like genes. We were looking at variation. Uh, within a species, looking at how can we understand continuous and discontinuous variation, trying to get the idea out about um, the actual characteristics an organism has got, the phenotype, is actually an interaction between the genetics that's there and the environment and what that actually means before we get on to the nitty gritty of some of the systems that's there. So, it's very hard if you're teaching outside your subject and that you're comfortable in. If a biologist teaching physics or a physicist teaching biology, etc., or a chemist teaching mathematics, maybe in a school, maybe they might find that harder because it's not something they've done a lot of work on themselves in their learning. Uh, but talking with colleagues who maybe have done more will allow people to know the sorts of things you need to sort out first. How you connect those together and then how you build on that to the more complex parts of learning within a topic uh, and then how do you help students get through that certainly some students can dive in pick up the easy parts quickly and start moving on the more difficult parts uh, very easily whereas others need quite a lot of help getting a foundation before they actually can move on to look at the more complex ideas and maybe even then may not fully understand those more complex ideas 
we've got a basic understanding that, say, in genetics, that it's got something to do with what you inherited from your parents. But it's not that you inherit this from your mum, you inherit that from your dad, you inherit from both parents. If you talk about humans, talk about uh, any animals or plants that sexually reproduce, and what you've got will be a combination of what comes from your parents. Just kind of small steps like that could help some children with their understanding. So, yeah, a lot of work to do, a lot of research still to be done. With good teachers just really work out the basics themselves and plan their activities, questions, and their learning around that. Thank you. I was, um, well, I, I was not sure what, what exactly was intended here, but um, it seemed to me that maybe the idea is you've got lots of activities and is there a flowchart? For deciding which activities should go to which students, and if that's the question, then the correct, I agree with Chris. The answer is no. But one thing I think might be worth considering is asking the students to choose. So if there are a variety mm -hmm. of activities, if you do have differentiated activities, then ask the students to choose, but then make sure that they do an after-action review after the task. How did you choose this task? What made you choose this task rather than others? And how appropriate do you think your task was? When did you realize this task was too easy for you? When did you realize you weren't learning anything? And so if we can actually help get students to a point where they could become more better, better choosers of intellectually demanding work for themselves, then that might also save the teacher quite a lot of time. So I would, I would be trying to develop that capability in my students of choosing tasks. And that's something I did a lot as a maths teacher. And um, you know, some students loved choosing their work. And some students would come to me and say, I've tried it. I prefer the work that you choose for me. So they were happy for me to choose work for them. So I think that um, developing that cap capacity in students is, is going to be contributing to things like metacognition, which we talked about earlier, which is always a good idea. Lovely. Thank you both very much. Um, right. Our next question comes from Nicola Wharton. Uh, Dylan, this is, I'm going to ask this to you because it's a GCSC maths class that she's talking about. So Nicola like, is wondering about um, if she could see a demonstration of effective differentiation, particularly in maths, where it's not about using worksheets for different levels of students. Well, I've given one example already, which is the lesson on trapeziums, and I think that's a very good example. So it's a model, I think, that, that um, we should try to emulate, which is a single activity so that all the students in the class are engaged in the same activity, but that the way the task is presented and the way the task is mediated by the teacher allows the possibility of of the teacher raising the level of difficulty for certain students if that's appropriate and maybe lowering it for others. So, you know, you could have an information sufficiency task and you know, there's 20 points, 20 marks for this question, but you're going to have to ask me for some information for this, to solve this question. And every, every question you ask me is going to cost you one point, one mark. So you've got to get students thinking very carefully about how much information, how much help they need. And so you, there's ways of building this in, but I, I think that we should basically go for a model of inclusive differentiation. That said, I think we have to um, be honest about the fact that how much of this you can do when students are doing different tiers in the same GCSE examination depends a lot on how carefully those tiers are designed. So in some cases, there's lots of overlap. Some of the, the topics can be done very easily. And in some of the topics, there's almost like completely different content for different tiers. And there, I, I find it hard to imagine any single activity that could be useful, use, equally useful for all the students in the group. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Dylan. Uh, thank you, Nicola, for your question. So, Chris, I'm going to move on to a question from Joe Clark. Joe asks, um, could you suggest some resources that she could access at primary levels for science and maths that she could use to extend children's learning at the top end that takes them into a greater depth rather than just moving them forward at a quicker rate. So any resources that you're aware of there? Um, I think the one that I like best is um, It's Not Fair or Is It? Uh, that was written by um, a group of people from the Association for Science Education. So I might not get all the authors here, but it's Liz Lawrence, uh, it was Brenda Keogh, uh, it was um, Jane, whose name I forget now, who's in charge of PSTT. Uh, uh, so a whole, whole range of people who, who uh, are members of the Association for Science Education. And what they did was to take uh, work done 
previously um, by the AXIS project, um, which was a project from about 20 years ago where we looked at <laughs> science and uh, assessment and uh, looking at inquiry from key stage two to key stage three. Um, and it looked at what's happened since then. And because of the national curriculum in the UK, many schools are focused only on the type of inquiry activities that require fair testing. Um, so they've not looked at other type of inquiries, and yet some of these inquiries uh, are really good, particularly for the top end, because they are uh, quite open in their approach, uh, have multiple ways of actually uh, solving those inquiry problems um, and can really take kids quite a long way. Mm -hmm. So I think that one in particular um, is a useful resource to pick up on and link to that from the inquiry approach, both in science and mathematics. There's quite a lot um, of materials on the various EU inquiry projects. Uh, so it'd be worth looking at some of those. So um, one science and maths one that's still running is the Maskill project. Might be worth looking at the Maskell project, um, the science one that's finished recently that we were involved in, the sales project, and taking it back and looking at other ones like Fibonacci, uh, Primas, and a whole range of others. All of those have produced activities um, that could be particularly stretching for your top end in science and maths, but at the same time, possibly involved in engaging your others as well. Uh, but they would do it at a slightly lower level because of the different uh, approaches. It's more open, therefore, kids can actually be guided to it if they're not getting the really high level. Um, whereas if they are getting there on their own, it's project. So I'd go for a more inquiry approach, and there's a lot of stuff around to help with that now. Thank you, Chris. So, uh, quite lots, loads of ideas there, so uh, particularly the idea about inquiry coming out very strong. Thank you, Chris. Um, oh, sorry, that was Joe's question. That's me going wrong. Thank you, Joe, for that. Uh, moving on now to Salwa Al Rashdi's question. So, Dylan, I'm going to ask you this one. Um, so, Salwa's asking, how can I manage to strike a balance between differentiating an assessment, since all students will be taking the same exam by the end of the semester and should do the same quizzes throughout the semester? Well, I think it's. I think it's really important to differentiate between differentiation, which is a way of dealing with the fact that you have students of different abilities in the same class. And when does that happen? When you have two students in the same class. And when you have two students, you need to differentiate because they're different. So differentiation is an approach to teaching. And I think it's, the important point is an assessment is simply a procedure for drawing inferences. And so if you've got all these students go for the same assessment, you need to be getting all the students to the same point, but they're not going to all going to, going to get there. So differentiation is really about ensuring that as many of the students in the class are engaged in activities that are likely to increase their chances of doing well on the examination at the end of the course. And the problem is, if you teach to the middle, then you're not stretching the students at the top, or you're not teaching the students at the bottom. And so it's, it, ultimately, I don't find any tension at all between differentiation and assessment. Because the purpose is to get every student the best possible chance of doing as well as they can on the exam at the end of the year. And as long as you're doing that, as long as the students are engaged in useful activities that are pointed in the same direction as, as, as the examination, they're most likely to be effective. So, in a way, the, 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 the examination just tells us what the destination is, and the differentiation is what are we going to be doing to get as many students to make as much progress as they can towards the destination? Thank you, Dylan. Uh, thank you, Salwa, for that question. And um, thank you, Dylan, for your response. Uh, moving on now, our last two questions, so we're nearly at the end, are about teacher development. Uh, so Chris and Judy has asked a question, how do we help teachers to find the appropriate balance between formative pre-testing or gathering of information and the attention to the quality explicit teaching that is required to fill the gaps that are uncovered and how do we how do schools ensure that teachers who need this learning the most access it okay uh, i think first of all you need to realize that 
If you're not going to, if you're going to make an assessment, you need to do something about it. If you find that there is some shortfall uh, in where the students are at with their learning. So if you haven't got time to do that, don't do the assessment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's going to collect too much assessment data, you can't handle it. Um, then the thing is to think more carefully about, so what can I handle? What is worth looking at that will help students move forward? I can do something about. Mm -hmm. So I will admit that uh, when we started looking at assessment for learning some 20 years ago, we did focus on the assessment, the assessment side of it, mainly because at that time, teachers needed support in developing those assessments, in trying to do it in class, in a way that allowed them to respond there and then, or allowed them to respond within the next lesson. I think some teachers took the assessment side of it and didn't actually um, latch on to the responsive part of it. They just used it to collect data, so they found out much more what their students couldn't do, rather than thinking, so what can't our student do now that I can do something about? Mm -hmm. um, so a lot more small-scale assessments as you're going through, rather than giving them huge diagnostic tests at the beginning and finding out a lot that they don't know, um, and then wasting some of that assessment time that could actually be used for learning time. Um, so I would tend to go in a very incremental way where, um, okay, you might add, uh, do three or four activities in the early part of a topic to find out where all your students are actually or not, find out where all of them are at within one assessment, uh, and then build on that and start taking them forward in small ways by just looking at what they're doing in class, observing, making inferences from the data you're collecting, and taking decisions to what to do then, uh, and then you know, waiting until you think you know, you've got to a certain point before you decide, right, well, let's use a hinge point question. That's a quick check to know whether they've got there and whether I can move on to this harder bit or not. Uh, but making those strategically, thinking about um, the amount of time you spend on assessment and the amount of time you spend on responding is important to work out. And don't just do assessments because it's there. Do them if you think you need them to find out more about your students. Only do them if you've got time to do them. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so we are here at our last question. And um, this is a question that's come from, from Mamanya Bakari. So Mamanya, thank you for your question. Mamanya has said that they are motivated by the course. So that's fantastic. Uh, they're asking, can they study further this course after completing here? Um, if possible, show the ways you've done in this course. So I think there's two ways we could interpret that. In terms of you can still access the course and its materials, Mamania, so they're open. Um, mentoring support will finish a couple of weeks after the course, but all the materials are there for you. If it's if you're asking the question about um, studying ideas that are underpinning the course, I'm going to pass over to Dylan and then Chris about differentiating for learning and assessment for learning and where they could continue their, their studying if they wish to. So Dylan, over to you first. When Paul, Chris and I started working in this area, um, we did get some criticism for calling this stuff a formative assessment. Or, um, because people were saying it's just good teaching. Um, I, and I've gone forwards and backwards on that issue. I now think that it's really important to keep that word assessment. Because when you talk about what it is that teachers do when they get information from a class, about where the student's thinking is at. That is fundamentally an assessment process. It is a process for drawing conclusions. And I think by, by calling this process an assessment, you draw attention to the adequacy of the evidence that teachers have for the decisions they need to take. And I think what we've seen is that as soon as people get that basic idea, as soon as teachers realize that the responses of confident volunteers are not a good guide to the learning needs of the kids who haven't got their hands raised, then I think the doors begin to open and you can, and, and the whole universe, universe of possibilities begins to open up. So I think the, the, the crucial stage is getting started and realizing that the quality of your, of your decisions will depend on the quality of evidence you have from the students, by collecting that, 
what we discovered is that the best way to improve the quality of your questioning is to talk and work with colleagues to pick up really good questions. So teachers' questions are improved hugely by working collaboratively with others. In terms of feedback, just taking a, a couple of exercise books and sitting down with a colleague and just rather than just doing the kind of 30 or 45 seconds that most teachers to take to mark an assignment, just slow it down and just say, what would it be most helpful to say to this student right now and to talk it over with that other teacher? And so I think the, the, the way forward, if you, you know, if, you, if you haven't got a course you can go on, is just to find some like-minded colleagues who want to try these ideas out and just to just become a bit more reflective about those processes that take microseconds when you're actually in, this, in the classroom and just making the snap judgments and seeing if you can slow that process down a little bit, think about it to make it a bit more thoughtful and you'll find that the quality of the questions you ask, the quality of the feedback you give just improves continuously through that kind of process. So of course there are courses there, there are books you can read, but ultimately I think improving practice here is not a process of knowledge acquisition, it's a process of habit change. I think too much professional development is about telling teachers what to do, and it doesn't work because what we need to do is to help teachers change what they do in classrooms. So ultimately, you, know, you need to practice this and to practice breaking the habits you've got into, and, and again, having somebody else willing to observe you and give you feedback on the things that you're trying to change about your own practice can be very helpful. So I would say there's lots of resources there, but there's no substitute for getting started on this journey with like-minded colleagues in your own school because then that'll be really focused on what you want to study. The trouble with courses is that they often reflect the desires of the person who designed the course, and that might match with what you want, it might not. So find some colleagues and work with them to improve the practice aspects that you think are most important for your work. Lovely, thank you, Dylan. Chris, anything you'd like to add to that one? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that some people have done uh, is to do the course again, um, because <laughs> The first time you go through, you tend to focus on what you're doing as a teacher. And although you'll be picking up some evidence from your learners, you're not focusing on your learners always because you're changing your habit. So um, if, if you've got, if you're doing that topic again, with maybe if you're a secondary teacher with another um, set of 13-year-olds next term, try it with them. Uh, or maybe try it next year uh, with 13-year-olds when you do it. This time, focus much more on what you'd expect from your learners at various stages in the course. Of um, and also start tweaking what you do. So not only will it match much more with what those students need, but you'll start to understand much better why some activities work better for differentiating than others. Um, I know some people with our assessment for learning course have done it um, three or four times already each time getting different things out of it. But sometimes going through the motions again, seeing it with different, more experienced eyes can be quite useful. Thank you. Thank you both. Chris, I was going to mention the other course, actually, the assessment for learning one, because that's very much about some of the themes that have come out tonight, about dialogue and thinking about the questions that you ask and the purpose of them. So that might be another thing from Amanda to do, is that the complimentary course. Okay, so... Thank you very much, Chris, Dylan and Chris. Um, just to wrap up then, so this is my, this is why you see the top of my head most of the time, because I am thinking and writing down. I think, for me, what's come out really strongly tonight, and you two, please feel free to, to challenge, but I think collaboration has come out really strongly um, in terms of teachers, as Dylan was just saying, teachers planning, teachers sharing resources, teachers sharing questions, teachers sharing ideas, teachers reflecting critically together about their practice and the impact it's having on students and then collaboration with you know amongst students getting students to talk getting students to discuss their ideas getting students to operate as learning resources for each other um, there's been a plethora of resources Dylan and Chris amaze me how their depth of knowledge so that they're giving relevant ideas that, that we can take away and think about but also that they're, they're also giving us the relevant research literature or you know Qualifying and critiquing the research background that's there is absolutely amazing. So we've had resources, we've had strategies, um, we've had lots of named uh, researchers to go and look up. But I think for me the biggest theme that's come out is purposefulness. I think that's come out really strongly. And it's that planning for it and then responding to it. 
So it's purposefulness in terms of the lessons, the tasks that you're going to choose and employ, the support that you're going to think about for your students, particularly I think it's come out about the students who are lower achieving, who are having more difficulties. The purposefulness about your groupings, regrouping the students, thinking about why they're working together. And then the purposefulness of the group work. So when you're grouping them, how you're actually getting them to work effectively as a group. The purposefulness of the questions that we ask, the data that we elicit. Now, Dylan will tell me if I've got this wrong. The decision-driven data collection. Proud of myself. Um, and how we develop that. And then thinking about the talk that we're getting to happen in the classroom, but talk with reasoning and explanation. So it's deeper so that we can find out more. So it's that thinking about the assessments and that handling of evidence. So I would just like to say a huge thank you on a Friday evening. So it's the end of a, a long week, I'm sure, for everybody. Um, thank you to Paul in the background who has got the, 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 the job of, of taking this all away and producing it for our participants and for other learners as well. So not just those on the course, but do tell colleagues because the richness of this material is incredible. Uh, thank you to the participants for all their questions and the National STEM Learning Centre uh, for their support in this course. But a huge thank you to Dylan and Chris because, as I say, you just amaze me how you can think and draw on all of this depth of knowledge. It just adds so much to all of our thinking. So. Thank you very much to everybody, and I hope we all have a nice, relaxing weekend. And Chris, that you get your voice back very soon. Sorry about my voice, mate. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>